Hello, party people. What's going on? <laughs> I felt like this week just flew by. This was like the fastest week of my life. I don't know if it's the weather or what, but um, here we are again so quickly. It feels like Southern California, finally. That's why. I, it does. It feels it's, great. It's beautiful. Best places in the world to live. Loving it. Um, so, listen, we have got such a fun guest this week. I'm so excited. Um, I, I, we all watched the show. It was one of the number one shows ever of all time. He's so iconic. Um, I was neighbors with him for many, many years. I'm not even sure if he knows that or not. And um, I was lucky enough we were doing a, um, a autograph convention and we got to have dinner and and somehow this guy is in tune with the Fountain of Youth because he looks exactly the same. <laughs> I am super <laughs> jealous. But uh, let's introduce Eric Estrada, everyone. Hey, hey, hey. Hello. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> the interrogation. <laughs> the interrogation Key begins. Key light. <laughs> hey, I listen. Listen, Nicole. Yeah. You're still stunningly beautiful. Thank you. you know, Thank you. The hair, the hair, the no hair, you could do or without it. You're fine. <laughs> You're gorgeous. Thank you so much. You know, the, the irony. Him not so much. Him not so much. No. Nah. Yeah. That's why he wears that hat all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, listen, I weirdly don't hate being bald. <laughs> I don't hate it. Um, yeah. I, I, I don't know. I hear Maybe you. I'll... Now me, I've got to I put this on every morning and oh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's such a trick. <laughs> you like that trick? That was cool. I love, I love, you still got a lot of hair, huh? Yeah, always. Yeah. I love that trick though. It's a, yeah. you know, I started the rumor that I'm bald and in California, 33 years ago, I did a David <laughs> Letterman show thing, and the young intern came up to get me in my dressing room, knocks on the door, and says, Mr. Estrada, uh, they're ready for you downstairs for a rehearsal, because we were doing an out-of-focus celebrity kind of a thing. And I said, okay, I'll be right down, but wait a minute. So I go like this. I go, I, I pretend I'm getting underneath it, then I oh, press my skin, and then I go like that. And then I, the kids looking at me, they, when I turned, he went, he looked down. And so I walked yeah. out, I walked out, went downstairs, did the rehearsal, that, that, that never said anything. Four or five years later, they call my manager and David Letterman is doing a segment where he's going to have uh, Burt Reynolds, uh, Bruce Willis, Mel Gibson, and he wants Eric Estrada to come on. And uh, will Eric take it off on the air? And my manager goes, take what off? <laughs> no, his hair. He <laughs> says, oh, man, did he get you with that trick? He got somebody there with that trick. It just so happens that the kid that was the intern there now is a writer for the show. And he wrote a segment because he saw me do this thing. And he thought, wow, let's do a segment where the celebrities that don't have hair and some that do have hair be on and will they take it off is it or isn't it was the name of the segment we never did it of course because it doesn't come right. off yeah. <laughs> that's so off. funny how it stuck anyway, with him that, that he was did that. not forget that that is that is very funny well that was always a thing back in the day right like which men wore toupees and which didn't it was yeah yeah, yeah they still do sure <laughs> And why not? I mean, whatever, you know, women wear wigs and yeah. Yeah. So who cares? Who, who cares about any of that? But, um, so, okay. We all grew up watching the show. Do you ever get sick of talking about chips or is it like something oh. that you just love so much that you, you can talk about it all day? Like, how is yeah. that? Well, it's, I would never be sick of Ponch, never be sick of the uniform, never be sick of the institution and what it means. Mm -hmm. And and look, from the age of four to 17, I wanted to be a New York City police officer. Oh. Okay. 
I grew up in uh, 103rd and 1st Avenue, Spanish Harlem, born in Harlem Hospital, raised in New Manhattan, New York. And when I was four, my mother fired my dad because he was stuck on the needle, you know? Oh. So she said, hey, get out of here. So, and then she started dating a cop. And that's where my love for law enforcement came from. Uh, I've only loved two men in my life. My grandfather, who used to, who taught me work ethics, used to take me with him when we used to sell snow cones in the streets of Harlem and Spanish Harlem. And he built my first shoe box. I shined shoes at Columbus Circle when I was 11, 12, and 13 every weekend. And so he taught me how to, you know, to go. There's a nickel to be made. You can do it. So just get up and go. And so at seven, so from the age of four to 17, I was going to be a New York City police officer. That's what I wanted. That was it. That's what I was going to do. That's what I wanted to be. At 17 years old, there was a pretty blonde, just like you, in high school. And I said, wow, she's so fine. I got to, mm, I got to meet her. I'm going to wait after school, after a period when she comes out. Maybe I could walk to the train, the bus, whatever. Maybe through Central Park, whatever. Through the bushes and through the woods, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so it turns out she wouldn't come out of the building the first day. And I said, I know I saw her. I said, I'll, I'll wait tomorrow again. I waited the second day. I said, I know I saw her. Tomorrow I'm going to follow her after eighth period. I'm going to give her a follow, see what she's doing. Where she's going? She's not coming out of school. She was going to drama club. Oh. So I said, ah, I'll tell you what. I grew up in the streets of Spanish Harlem. I can act. I can do that. Let me audition, get in, and grab the girl. Well, I auditioned. I got in, and I got bit by the acting bug. And that was all she wrote. And I said, oh, my God. God, I was, I was in a great place of finding something that really grabbed me by the heart, by the mind, just by everything it was performing. And then the, what was the bad part about it was I had to go tell my mother, Ma, you got to live in the projects a little longer. I can't get you out. <laughs> <laughs> I say, I know, mijo, no, mijo, no, 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 por favor, mijo, tú ibas a ser policía. Yo quiero que tú seas policía. No puede ser eso. I say, ma, ma, I got to give it a shot. I really dig it. I really like the feeling I get when I'm out there. People come up to me and they say, oh, you were great in this little thing and that. And and I understood where they were coming from and what they enjoyed. But And they felt what they felt. But nobody felt what I felt while I was doing it. And I want more of that. So. So anyway, I went through this whole thing with my mother. She cried for like two weeks. After a while, I said, look, Ma, I'll make a deal with you. If I can't make any money in this acting thing, I can come back to New York, be eligible to go to Albany Police Academy because 32 is a cutoff date for eligibility to be a, an applicant. And uh, I, mijo, no, mijo. I said, Ma, I want you to live better than this. I want you to be my queen. I want to put you, I want to put you on Central Park South, overlooking the tavern on the green, overlooking the park. I want you to have a doorman. I want you to have a pool in the building, but I know you'll never use it. But <laughs> all this and all that. I know me who no, no. <laughs> she kept on. So now here I was graduating high school. My teacher, drama teacher, Rita Brawley, says, Hey. Why, what college are you going to go to? I says, I'm not going to go to college. Why not? I said, I want to be an actor. I'm going to go chase it. She says, you should have something to fall back on. I said, I don't want anything to fall back on. I want to be an actor. I want to go for it. So in her 35 years of teaching drama, a British teacher, she said, okay, I've only told two other students in my teaching career that go ahead, chase it. One of them is married. And the other one's selling cars. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, go chase it. I said, yeah, I'm going to chase it no matter what you say. <laughs> go after it. And, uh, well, I went after it. 
and then I realized, oh my God. So I got into movies. I would approach location managers that came to New York back in the late 60s, early 70s to do movies that came from California, like Cactus Flower with Math with uh, 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 Goldie Hawn um, and the other guy of, of the Odd Couple. God, what's the name? Not Jack, the other one. Come on, come Tony on. Tony Randall? Oh, uh, Tony Randall? Yeah. No, not Tony Randall. He wasn't in that. It was the other guy, the grumpy oh, yeah. guy in The Odd Couple. Yes. Uh, Jack Klugman? Um, no, not Jack Klugman. So I, I thought it was only the Tony Randall face. and Jack Klugman. Who am I blowing? His guy's face is right here, but I can't get his name. Matthew Moten, uh, Walter Matthau. Yes, yes, oh, yes, okay. yes. Walter Matthau. Yes. I thought you were going TV Matthew. version. Sorry. So I worked on that like four or five days. I got tw as an extra. I got $27.15 a day as an extra. And then when we finish at two or three in the morning, I run across town to another set. The other Townis was filming also. That was for Cactus Flower. Then I run across town to uh, Grand Central Station to be like a you know, traveler with a suitcase. They gave me an empty suitcase to walk back and forth uh, uh, in, in, in out of town as with Jack Lemon, Sandy Dennis. And then from there, I went on to John and Mary, where I got, where they had a big crowd yelling and screaming. So the, the extras casting director, Rich, Marty Richards says to me, hey, yell, scream, protest. And we're picking out people to Taff Hartley for the SAG card. And that's how I got my SAG card was on John and Mary. But I was making $27.15 a day chasing these movies. And my mother was coming in the mail and she would, and my nickname was Papo. That was my street name. Hey, Papo, come here. That was my street, they say gang name, but no, street name. <laughs> so, Papo. Oh, yeah, Papo, P A P O. Like so, it. All these envelopes are coming in, you know, because I'm working constantly, you know, I'm jumping from one set to another to another. I don't care. I just I just keep the landlord, you know, with my buddy who just passed away last week, uh, two weeks ago. The landlord was great with Marky Bay and Jeff Bridges. Back in the day, I worked that. But I would approach location managers and I would say to them, hey, I want to be an extra in your thing. And they would, they would, you know, like, hey, who is the street urchin? And, and, and then I would say, look, what are you going to do if you're shooting on the street? And there's a bunch of people making noise, a bunch of guys that are stoned, jacked up, and they're telling you to go, you know, eat shit and die. We live here. Uh, it, 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 the cops ain't going to do squat. You hire me. You pay me what you pay these people that walk around, extras, I call them. <laughs> You pay me that and I'll take care of you. I'll take care of things so that you can get your shot. You can get your thing, you know? And so that worked. And, and every time a production came to town, they would say, get that Estrada kid. Cause and then I, <laughs> yeah, I hire a couple of guys, give them five bucks. Hey, tell take that guy around the block for, for while we get this shot. You know, I took like care the mob of it's like the mob boss of atmosphere. <laughs> yeah. Of the ghetto, the mob boss of the ghetto. <laughs> so anyway, you know, I did that. And then a movie came along. My first movie came along that I had to audition for Don Murray, the director, who was in Hoodlum Priest. And then he did uh, Bus Stop with Marilyn Monroe. Wow. And Don Murray uh, did a Christian film where he played a priest. And in the Christian way, their way is that once you get tapped by Christ on the shoulder, and he taps you, you pay it forward. So he seeked this movie called The Cross and the Switchblade, a true story by uh, written, a book was written by Reverend David Wilkerson out of Phillipsburg, Pennsylvania, who was in his barn reading about the daily news and the street gangs in New York. See, the gangs in New York were different. We were different, they were different. Not we, they, they were different. <laughs> because back then you fought with your fists, if you had a stick, my favorite weapon, I, I I saw it. My favorite weapon is just, you, you go by a car and you take the antenna and you smash, you just go like this and it snaps off and you open it up and man, you could swing. You could have a good time swinging and knocking people out. 
It was great. It, let me, I saw that. Anyway, <laughs> it was like, okay. So he, read, he reads in the daily news that Brooklyn, the Mau Mau's, back in the late 50s, early, mid, late 50s, mid 60s, was a gang called the Mau Mau's in New York City. Bad, the baddest ass gang ever. I mean, really get you down, put you down, keep you down, put you out. Uh, the warlord of that gang, every gang had a warlord. The warlord would be the guy that says, okay, we're going to fight. You, we're going to fight with this, you know, just like in the original West Side. As a matter of fact, when I was 13, I watched him shoot the original West Side story down my street. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it was a trip. It was, wow. you know, all these tough guys. And then all of a sudden they start doing this and this. Dancing. And I went, oh. <laughs> Yes. What gang is that? <laughs> so, anyway, anyway, so um, he uh, read in the newspaper. The warlord is the guy that decides where you're going to fight, what you're going to fight with, and when. There's, his name was Nicky Cruz, who's a Puerto Rican kid, went back in Puerto Rico. When his father wanted to punish him, his father would stick him in the kitchen and the, in the, 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 chicken coop overnight oh. now you know you know chicken coop man you just when they stir they just go all over. anyway so the model of the mamas was to draw blood in a fight nikki cruz was so bad so he wrote he went he was in his barn he reads the paper and he said that the lord talked to him and said go to new york and help these kids and he did he came to new york he sought out the meanest, baddest gang, and the warlord was a kid named Nicky Cruz. Well, I auditioned for that role. Six improvisation callbacks. Oh, all wow. of them. And then when they finally got down to the last two people, which was me and the kid that was up the down staircase, his name, I don't know his name, but he was a really good looking, tall, Italian guy, stunning great leather coat with Sandy Dennis, the up the down staircase movie. And I was up against him and I didn't have anything but spit. So on my last callback, which I knew they were bringing in Pat Boone to play the Reverend, the movie's called The Cross in the Switchblade. And uh, I was auditioning for the role of the Switchblade, Nikki Cruz. So I went to 42nd Street and I bought a Switchblade over the counter. And I brought it to the audition, but I had it in my back pocket and nobody knew I had a switchblade. You don't bring a real knife to an audition. Right. right. But I figured I needed an edge. I needed something because all I had was spit. And this guy had already had a movie. I needed something to get me over the fence or at least climb on it. So in the audition, uh, I get up there and Don Murray says, okay, this kid's on stage other actors from Juilliard and all these fine dramatic schools, all right? And me from 131st Spanish Art, <laughs> the, school of, the school of street. I go up and I'm really raw. I mean, I'm raw, you know, the F-bomb kept coming out and you know, a bunch of other Latin stuff kept coming out. So he says, okay, this is your, your family. Go up on the stage and then there'll be a knock at the door. and." We'll, Continue from there. So I said, okay. So I got the blade in my back pocket. I go up the stage. There's a long table. A bunch of kids sitting here and here talking. A lot of them, some of them were from Juilliard. Some of them were from that drama school in 60th Street between, between Amsterdam and Columbus by St. Paul the Apostle School. Artistic, uh, very artsy, craftsy kids. And I get up there and I go, okay, everybody, listen up. Nobody's looking. They're not listening. So I start FMing and dropping the F-bomb to get their attention. And I realized that's not cool. I got to be, I, I can't go there because then they're, they, they're going to just throw me out the window. So um, I said, okay, listen up. This is what we're going to do. I want to go to the movies and then I want to get pizza after the movie. But at the movies, I'm going to get candy, Coca-Cola, chocolate, all kind of popcorn. So we're going to go to my piggy banks. And one kid looks at me and he goes, 
uh, uh, piggy banks? Like, I said, yeah, my piggy banks. Where all my, all my where I keep my change, parking meters, and telephone booths. Because then it was easy. You just go. <laughs> <laughs> it was easy back then. I mean, stuff was, it was really easy. And not that I saw that. I didn't yeah. do it. Right, right. Of course. Saw that stuff. So I um, I said, because I want to go to the movies and this and that. And then there's a knock at the door. I said, you, go get the door. Go get the door. So he got the door, opened the door. And you open the door. And Pat Boone is standing in the doorway. Okay. And he says, is Nikki here? I have a message for him. So I lean over and I just look. I give him the once over. I just look at him. Nothing. Then he says it again. He says, I came here to see Nikki. I'm looking for Nikki. I have a message for him. So the kid looks at me and I look, look back. I get up. From the, I get up and I take my to get everybody's attention out there the casting director, the producers, that, 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 you know, all the clowns that sit up and judge you. So I grab the chair and I throw it across the stage. I mean, you got a chair being thrown across the stage. That's going to get somebody's attention and they're going to be boom right on me. So I get up and I just sling it and I walk over to Pat Boone. And he's right here in the doorway, okay? He's right there in the doorway. And he looks at me and he goes, are you Nikki? And I don't say anything. I just look at him and I wolf him. It's this thing we used to do in the street where you wolf a guy. You just get up in his face. I mean, you literally urinate on him, you know, visually. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's called wolfing before you fight, before you're going to throw down. And he says, are you Nikki? And I just don't answer him. I just stare him right in the eye. And he says, he's here. And he says, I have a message for you. He says, Jesus loves you. He says to me, Jesus loves you. And I, of course, not going to say anything. So I start gripping my, see this here? I start going like this. I'm trying to make the muscles go boom, 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 boom. Like you're pissed off, you know? Yeah. And then I grab him by the lapels of his blazer and by the lapels. And I push him up, up against the wall. Right? So I got him up. I put him in push him up against the wall, put my hand on his chest, flush him to the wall, and I take the switchblade out, and it's... Oh, shit. <laughs> In the back of the room, Don Murray the, says, Stop! Stop! End of scene! Stop! Scene over! Stop! <laughs> but, but it got me the part. Nice. I got the part. That was my first part. So that's how I, so I was making 800 a week for eight weeks to shoot this movie all over New York City. My mother was like, oh, I moved her to Regal Park, Queens. I took the Puerto Rican and stuck her in a Jewish neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> and she, she was like, hi, Papo, these people. <laughs> <laughs> Now, for now, this is where you're going to live. We're going to do better. We're going to do better. But I want to get you out of the city. So I got her out of the city. So and then I do the movie. I go back to working at Yellow Fingers on 60th Street and 3rd Avenue across from Bloomingdale's. There's a restaurant called Yellow Fingers. I was a waiter there. That's how I paid for my American I went to AMDA and, and you know, to get to get some culture and some training. And I went to a Philip Burton school called AMDA, American Musical Dramatic Academy. They got one here in California now. So I went there at the same time, uh, 
I couldn't go back to doing extra work because I already did a co-starring role. I played the role of Nikki. Nikki today, who received Christ by this preacher from Phillipsburg, Pennsylvania, who eventually had one of the Broadway theaters as his monas, as his, uh, mo you know, his. Oh yeah, his ministry. Yeah, ministry. Yeah. And he just passed a couple of years ago. And he also started Teen, teen Challenge. It took young people from uh, environments and helped them out. Nice. Yeah. And so, but Nikki got tapped. And he's he's bringing more people to Christ as we speak. Still. Still. Oh. Still doing it. Wow. Yeah. yeah, still doing it. So... So I figured, you know, the man tapped me to be in this movie, but he let me run off and play in the 70s and 80s and go to Studio 54. Shh. <laughs> and hang out with Rick James. Shh. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> I mean. Anyway. Anyway, that was my first movie. And then I had to go back to being a waiter. And, and then, of course, uh, to keep my chops up, I would get into various workshops uh, in New York with very – Good, good uh, guys that ran workshops like Dave, uh, Melvin Nelson. He had a musical comedy workshop that I took, you know, and it was great. And a lot of the soap opera stars from back then were going to that workshop. I, I met them all, Theo and Maggie, and oh, it was great. Anyway, so I just kept going up for stuff. And then a movie came to town called The New Centurions, Joseph Wanbod's book. Uh, he wrote Onion Field and, and 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 all that, and I read the I ran out and read the book, and I said, "Oh man, I can play this role with my hands tied behind my back, the role of the Chicano cop, young Chicano rookie cop called Sergio Duran. He was the lead in the book and everything. So I go up and I meet Charles and Winkler, the producers who did Rocky and a bunch of other stuff, and I read for them. They said, "Very good." Uh, uh, tomorrow, the director, Richard Fleischer, is flying in. You come back, you read with him, you read for him, he'll to meet you. So I did that the next day. Ba, 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 ba. So a week goes by, two weeks go by, two and a half weeks go by. I call the agent and say, what's going on with this thing? What, what, you know, what's going on with this part? I said, I, I, that part is mine. I know it's mine. I can do it. It's me. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, they said, well, they went back to Los Angeles. There's casting the role of Kovinsky. In the book, Kovinsky is about this big. He's a cop who <laughs> commits suicide for whatever mm. reasons, right? Depression or whatever. I said, okay, so what does that mean to me? He says, well, they're talking to George C. Scott, who just <laughs> turned the who just turned the Oscar down for Patton. You remember when he did that? <laughs> yeah. Which was like, whoa, I can't believe he turned on the Oscar. Anyway, uh, he wouldn't take it. He didn't believe that actors should be categorized. And, you know, we're all actors. We're all, we all, if, we, if you like what we did, that means we were good in doing what we, the mission was as an actor. So I said, oh, man, what about the role of Sergio? And he said, hey, it's still not cast. I said, okay, listen, I'll tell you what we're going to do here. If I can get to California, I'll take a red eye, get there at three, four in the morning, whatever time it is, whatever time it is, TWA back in the day, or Pan Am. <laughs> I go way back. <laughs> and and you got to get me in the office that morning because I don't have, I, I, I can't stay in a hotel. I got to go and walk in. Let's meet them again and walk out. So he said, okay, yeah, we have Jack Fields and Associates over on Sunset. Jack Fields, the, so if, if an actor went to New York, they would handle the actor for, you know, and they split the commission when the guy gets by coastal and agents do that. Yeah. So they got me in and I walk in and there's Fleischer and Charter from Winkler. I say, hey, you guys left New York without giving me my part. What's the matter with you guys? You make me come all the way out here. I don't have money to go to a hotel. I got to fly back out today. So make up your mind. Am I going to do the role or not? <laughs> they, they gave me a look like, who is this? Who is this street urchin? This rug rat. And they gave me the part. 
So now I, I, since they didn't fly me out, I had to, you know, they didn't have to pay per diem me or any of that stuff. I had to get my own house and everything. But it was a thousand bucks a week for 11 weeks. I lived out here in California, in North Hollywood. And, yeah. uh, and it was great working with George C. Scott, yeah. Stacey Keats, Rosalind Cash, just the cast, Scott Wilson, all these people. It was great. And it was my second movie, co-starring role, man. Unbelievable. And, and as a cop. And as a cop. Yeah. So, so the thing ends, and I have to return the car I was driving. I lease the Cadillac, smoking. And, <laughs> and then I went back to New York, and then I went back to work at, at uh, the restaurant, Ye Yellow Fingers. It's still there in the corner of 2nd Avenue and it goes north. That's 3rd Avenue and 60th Street. And then down the street is Serendipity. Across the street is Bloomingdale's. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 And I went back to work there. And then, of course, I'd go back to a workshop. Now, in about five months after that, the movies are being edited and put together for distribution and all that. And I should have been in California, but I'm still living in New York. I get offered a Hawaii Five-0 to play Simon Oakland's Simon Oakland, the actor, to to play his racketeer son. I said, I don't care what it is, Hawaii <laughs> from Harlem. Yeah, let me go. <laughs> Bite me. Let's go. Yeah. So I go to Hawaii for nine days. I kill it at the Kahala Hilton. Uh, Oh, what a great time I had there. Uh, I and, bet. And, and then I got to meet Jack Lord, who always had the attitude that it was his island. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> and something happened. Something happened on, on that set that just blew my mind. And I'd never seen uh, it, it before. We're shooting on the sand on the beach. The lights are up, the chairs are there, boom, boom, boom. The wind's starting to blow a little bit. So I'm sitting there, I got a scene with McGarrett, you know, Jack Lord, and a, a truck, a grip truck is rolling onto the sand, coming real close to the, the cameras and where we're here, and the truck's over here, and it stops. And first of all, for me, it's weird to see a truck on the beach. I come out of Spanish Harlem. There's no beaches <laughs> over there, okay? Yeah. <laughs> the first time I went to the beach was when my mom started dating this cop, Pete Panos, the cop. He worked CSI. So I used to go through his briefcase and stuff and just fascinated. I'd see eyeballs hanging out, cutthroats, just ah. knives and heads. I loved it. I loved it. And I said, I want to catch the guy that did this. I want to catch the person. I, I just... <laughs> I was so into it, you know, and he took us to the beach for the first time, you know, and, and that was really Jones Beach, New York. Anyway, so this truck pulls on the sand and I'm watching, I'm going, wow, what a trip. I've never seen a truck on the big sand. So I was just fascinated by that. And I'm looking at it, looking at it. Hmm. Then Garrett comes out of the motorhome, which was nearby, and they brought the truck out so it would block the wind. So his hair would stay oh. in place. Isn't that, I said, oh my God, I want that kind of power. <laughs> so I did the Hawaii Five O. Then went back to New York, back to my routine. The two movies hit Broadway, you know, 42nd Street, uh, 7th Avenue and Broadway. Uh, the two movies hit the street. The Crossing Switchblade's playing over here. New Centurion's playing yeah. over here. And I take my mother to see them both in one night. And she goes, I papo. I, I papo. <laughs> she was, I had her. I was, I was in. Yeah. But they call me to come to LA to dub the studio at Radford over here to, to, to loop. The whole wife I've all because of uh, uh, ambient noise and stuff 
Sure, the beach. So I told my, and you know, they flew you first class then, and, and they still do if you're guesting on any show. That's the sad thing. I told my mother, Ma, I'm going to cash in my return ticket and I'm going to stay because these movies were out on the street and I'm here in New York working as a waiter when I should have been in California where I could walk anybody's office, didn't have to audition, just tell them, hey, you want me? I'm good for your part because I got these two movies, a bad guy and a good guy. So, you know, but no, I was out in New York. So I'm going to cash in my return ticket. I mijo. I said, ma, I got to do it because I want you to live like a queen. I want you to live like goddess. I'm going to take care of you. Um, so I moved out and I moved to Colfax and Burbank Boulevard. It's called Club California. It's still there. Jerry Brown owned it. That's where he had his romance with Linda Ronstadt. If you want a little gossip. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> Colfax yeah. and Burbank. That's like, I live right, not too far from there. That's so funny. Yeah. Yeah. That's called Club California. But. I was paying $155 a month. I had, <laughs> I had a parking spot. We had a pool. We had a gym. We had a barbecue. We had jacuzzi. And we had all the females you could uh, talk with. Just got to talk to <laughs> all of them. <laughs> great times. Great times. $155 a month. <laughs> yeah. Could you, yeah for, and, and the room was just a studio. And it was as big as my den right now. And I lived there for three years and I didn't get a job in acting. And I already oh. had a guest spot on Hawaii Five O. I had to start all over. I had to start all over. So what I did was I got a job working at Enterprise Auto Leasing where I would detail cars and deliver them to Michael Land. They all, they all drove Rolls Royces. That's why I got hooked on the car. And then I ended up with Ford down the road. When I became Flavor of the Month, I had the bread, you know? Yeah. I delivered them to Diane Ross, Richard Pryor, Michael Landon, Tony Savalas. They all had Rolls Royces. And I'd have to deliver them. And I got hooked on the car. You don't drive that car because it's a Rolls Royce. All right? You drive that car because of the way it makes you feel. It's like taking your favorite armchair or your lazy boy down the street. Nah, 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 yeah. nah, nah, nah. It is such a great ride and such a rush. But, you know, but I end up, I would end up going to Home Depot and loading the back seat with plants and two by fours or whatever I needed, whatever I was building for my, my property. <laughs> yeah, I didn't get, it was, it was a car but I liked the ride I got hooked anyway so so I move out and I get a job at Enterprise Auto Leasing they were on La Brea then it turned into Famous Amos at Cookies on La Brea and yeah South. I remember that place that used to be where I worked but it was Enterprise Auto Leasing not the big chain today it was an independent Irv Fox used to run it and he hired me because I didn't have a car and he'd let me take a car to an audition if I needed it. And then I worked Friday and Saturday nights at the Red Chariot. It was a bar. Right now it's a Starbucks. But it was a bar on the corner of Van Nuys, one block east of Van Nuys on Burbank Boulevard across from Ralph's. It's a Starbucks. I used to, it's called the Red Chariot. I call it the Red Toilet <laughs> when I worked. Okay. Because it was a biker, biker joint. And I'm standing there with my Pierre Cardin and my Gavin Dean and Penny Lopez <laughs> at the door. Worked the door Friday and Saturday. Because who had money for dates? But I always got breakfast Sunday morning. It was great. <laughs> Last call. <laughs> <laughs> Cheap so, dates. <laughs> so and then, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. So, and, so and then I started going up on... Uh, Mark Harris, who worked for Jack Fields and Associate, sent me out on calls. And then I got me a one day silent, well, it wasn't a silent bit. It was an, an emergency. Granted, I came off two movies, co starring roles. Those two movies got me eligible to be an Academy member. And I vote on the Oscars every year since then. And, and, because to be to qualify to be an academy member, 
if you're an actor, you got to get two signatures from two people that are already members from that branch. And you got to have been in two starring or co-starring roles. And I had that off right off the bat. So I got in real quick, get all the free movies. And I feel like a big shot going to the studio. My date with my wife, I said, hey, uh, would you, okay, I watched you. She, you know, we met on the Stairmaster, okay? <laughs> yeah. Well, man, she was awesome. I'd watch her for like two months on the Stairmaster, hair down to her knees. Uh, she used to be a ballerina, you know? And uh, I, one day I said, hey, you know, the, the screening movies at Warner Brothers, because we would work out here and take 20. It was take 20 and then it was something else. And and I said, what about, uh, would you like to go to dinner and a movie with me? I got to vote. I got to go see movies I got, cause I, so I can give a vote for the Oscars. She said, uh, I said, consider me gay. I said to her, <laughs> you know, I just want companionship. You know, to go to see a movie, have dinner, talk about the movie. Da, da, da. He says, okay, let's go. So I pick her up a few days before, and we're going to go to Warner Brothers to see a movie. But first, we're going to go to an Italian kitchen somewhere on Alameda. And we went there. We never got out of the restaurant. We just sat there for five hours, laughing and having a great time. We never saw the movie. Then I took her home, and, uh, you know, and you know what? What happened was I saw her work out. I used to get there and get on the stairmaster and do my forty minutes or whatever at my level, and she'd be there when I got there. And when I left, she'd still be on it. I go, damn! But one day she got off and I went over to the mat to stretch, and she put a leg up in Oregon, the other one in Mississippi, and I went, damn, damn. <laughs> And well, we're married 30, almost 30, well, we're together 33 years, but married like 28. I love that. Yeah. So anyway, I'm sorry. I did. Yeah. I'm doing all the talking here. No, Don't you well, what we're here for. <laughs> oh, <laughs> we want to hear it. <laughs> okay. So there we go. I do my first gig in California, living in a room like this. Remember the room had one window, a little air conditioner. A, a, a half a refrigerator, two electric burners for a stove, and a, half, a little sink, you know, a little sink. But I ran to Pier One Imports, got tapestry, made a shell ceiling out of it. I built like a tent, like if you were in, in Saudi Arabia and, and you walked into a tent after s struggling with a camel in the, in the desert, you know, getting inside. Yeah. So I, I fixed it up that way. Uh, cute. It's cute. I had a closet and a bathroom. And uh, and it was really cute. And I lived there for three, year, three years. So my first gig is emergency. Uh, right? And here's my line. I only have one line. <laughs> I'm being carried out by the two leads of the show. And I'm on a gurney. My line is, ah! Ah! <laughs> <laughs> I got burned. <laughs> I got burned. They, 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 I got fried. And that was my first line. And then from there, I went on to do uh, Owen Marshall with Lee Majors. Remember Lee Majors and E.G. Marshall? Was it E.G. Marshall? Owen Marshall was the name of the show. He was a lawyer with a uh, $6 million man. Lee Majors was a lawyer. So I did an episode of that. Of course, stereotypical, the villain. <laughs> and then I did a Beretta. And then, oh, I did yeah. a, and then I did a Mannix. Then I did a Joe Forrester. Then I was getting top of the show, guest star, TV guy billing and all that good stuff, you know? And TV guy billing. I love, I love that <laughs> reference right now. Remember, yeah. remember that? You open yeah. it up. To see, oh, hey, I'm on Kojak tonight. And I was on Kojak uh, as, as an arsonist being accused of burning a building, but I didn't do it. And something interesting happened on that set. So Telly Savalas is right there. 
I'm in his office. The desk is in front of him, and I'm on the other side of the desk, and and he's going to interrogate me and talk to me. And I'm ready. I'm ready. I got my lines down. Mm. And he starts talking to me, but he's not looking at me. He's looking over here. He's looking over here. And so I, I, I would move over to get, you know, to do the eye thing. And as I do that, he goes to the other side. And, and, and I'm going, what's going on here? So I finally turn around and look. He was behind me. Teleprompter. Oh. <laughs> Shit. I said, I said, again, I said, damn, I want this kind of power. One day I want this power <laughs> that these guys have. Because, you know, I, I was of the school of you learn your lines, you show up, you hit your mark, you do what you got to do, you listen. And boom, all those years that I, well, about two and a half years, I did the extra work stuff. I did this and this. So I could tell you what a nine light is, what a barn door is, what a cable, what everything that goes on on the other side of the camera. So, because I wanted to know, so that because one day I'm going to camera left, camera right, you know, all the, all the angles, everything. So when I open my mouth, they know that, oh, this kid knows something. You know, he's not green. And so, uh, yeah, Ma. Just sneaking in here. Okay, you you want to hear me talk? I always hear you talk. <laughs> <laughs> so Wait, so I, I have a question for you. So what did your mom think when you landed chips? And it's kind of full circle because she wanted you to be this police officer yeah. right and then As, here you are playing one on tv but it's like the biggest show and, ever and, and i'm a deputy sheriff today in real life are you oh yes. okay. i work in the crimes against children in the state of virginia oh no shit years. okay yeah. wow yeah. so no well we'll get there so my mother well first my mother was i papa this is nice first i buy her a house in tarzana california South of the boulevard, circular moon driveway, going one way, come out the other. The backyard is, is half an acre. And I say, Ma, I can make that look like Puerto Rico. Whatever you want, Ma. I'll design it. And she goes, mm, it's nice, mijo. Mijo means son. It's nice, my son. And I'm going, oh, shit, something's wrong. I know something's wrong here. I said, look, Ma, I got to go. I'll be back Saturday. I'll pick you up at noon. We'll go to lunch. I figure I'd take it to the Ivy, show her off, you know. Bop, bop, bop. I go to pick her up a week later. And I already bought her house. And I'm still, I'm living now. Now I'm living in a condo on Studio City condo on Koufax. Because I went from Bur uh, Koufax and Burbank to Akema, across from the Beverly Garland, Dead Street, yeah. uh -huh. one bedroom. and then, then I moved to uh, to to Studio City condos, and now I'm up on the hill on your well. We won't tell people my street. Yeah, yeah we won't say the name, the E word. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> so my mother is just uh, so she's sitting in this house. I pick go to pick her up Saturday, and she's sitting in the living room, and I could tell she was upset because I knew my mother. And like the back of my hand. And I said, Mom, ¿qué pasó? What happened? Neighbors say something to you? Who? One over here, over there, across the street? Who, Ma? Tell me. No, mijo. No, no, papo. It's not like that. I said, then what's wrong, Ma? Why that look? Why this vibe? What's going on? She goes, I want to go back to New York. <laughs> <laughs> she wanted to go back to New York. Ain't that a trip? That wow. is a trip. I said, did, she go? did she go back or did she stay? Well, whatever my mother wanted, I did. She got. You know, yeah. except became an actor. She wanted me to be a cop. So I moved her to 57th and 8th Avenue, that building, the yeah. share field, where you drive from 57 to 56 in the middle of the street. And the, the, the doorman is in the middle of the block. That's the only street in New York City that has that. And 
that building was, I put her in there. She was the tent tenant in that building. It's got a doorman. It's got security. It's got a pool. It's got Starbucks at the bottom. And you're on 57th and 8th Avenue. She's on the 27th floor. She sees Tavern on the Green. Uh. And, and southern, it's the southern part of Central Park. So she a happy camper. And I took care of everything for 32 years. Wow. I wouldn't let her work. I took care of everything. I even paid for the toilet paper, everything. I took care of my mother really good, which was my That's dream true. because she was my motivation to make the bucks. So I'm out here bouncing from episode to episode to episode to episode, medical center, an arrogant tennis player. I was a junkie in Mannix. That I knew because I used to watch my pop shoot up when I was two and a half, three years old. I, and, and and I saw somebody shoot up in a, on a Lee Marvin when Lee Marvin had that show. He had a black and white TV show. Lee Marvin was a detective. M Squad. Was it M Squad? Oh. I think it was M Squad. Anyway, anyway. And I saw that and I went, oh, that's... You know, put two two together. Uh, so now Chips comes around. Well, before that, but in the interim of all these little guest spots, playing the stereotypical badass Latino, the guy with the gun, the knife, the brick, the pimp, the badass. Boom. I was doing, I did a movie called Airport 75, where I play Julio, the flight attendant, with, mm -hmm. of course, Chuck Heston. And then I did a movie, the same director, Jack Smite, was directing a movie called Midway, the original Midway. And he said, hey, Estrada, uh, I really like working with you. Uh, I have another movie. Uh, it's a smaller part, less dialogue. I said, hey, I came here to work and make money. I got my mom to take care of. So what is it? He said, well, it's a couple of weeks in a movie. You'd be one of the four pilots, Eddie Albert Jr., Dennis Rucker, Philip Allen, and me. Of the four pilots in the original movie, but it's also with it was also with uh, Charlton Heston. Oh, and what I love was here I was the kid coming in, and all the old guys going out like <laughs> Glenn Ford. Me and Glenn Ford became good drinking buddies. Uh, Henry Fonda, I met Robert Mitchum. You know all the old school boys. It was great. It was great. It was really cool. One. I was at one variety thing that things that I remember that are now coming back as I'm getting in the autumn of my years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, re too. I remember Sinatra looked at me across the table. He was at another table with Dino and, 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 and Sammy. And I was at a table with Charles Bronson, uh, Jill Ireland, Ricardo Matilban and his wife. Julio Iglesias with some gorgeous, just out of high school kid, and 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 and, and, and Burt Reynolds and Lonnie, and I look over to see Sinatra and go, oh, wow, Shepard. and he looked over at me and he went like this. I about fell out. He gave me the <laughs> nod. Oh shit! Are you kidding? Then I became very good friends. I dated a beautiful lady, sweet lady named Beverly Sassoon for a couple of years. Wonderful lady. Uh, and she was friends with um, Sammy's wife. God, what's... Coño, como se llama? All these people, like... I mean, I'm at... Getting, I'm, you know, I'm 70... I just turned 75. So I'm at that age where you see the faces, but the names escape you. <laughs> I got well, a lot of I got still a lot of some prevagen. Anyway, so uh, Sammy Davis's wife. Okay. Uh, anyway, so anyway, that 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 in the interim, I did a movie called Track Down with with uh, Kathy. Oh God, Jim Mitchum and Kathy Lee Crosby. And then I did a couple of independents. Then I did some real zero crap because I got blacklisted after chips and, and I couldn't get a job in this town because I own 50% of the net profits of the show. And they wanted to, and I wasn't going to have it. Nobody's going to, you know, if I'm looking. And uh, so I took them on. I took David Beagleman on, you know, and then they replaced me with Bruce Jenner for seven episodes. Uh, 
and and I'm wondering, did that have anything to him? Well, anyway. <laughs> I had no idea. I didn't know that. Okay. I remember that. I was the actor that took on David Bigelman, MGM. Yeah. I remember <laughs> that part. I don't remember Bruce Jenner. <laughs> oh, I do. I do. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. He was on for seven episodes. And then when I when see, I found out my attorneys was Larry Cuppin and Harry Sloan. They were, they were John Snyder's attorneys and Tony and, and, Gary Coleman's attorney and my attorney at that time. And they made a fortune so much that they bought New World from Roger Corman after oh, wow. they finished with us. But the deal was that MGM had to deliver six years of print with Eric Estrada as Poncherello because they made a deal their deal at the end of the fourth season with Golden West Broadcasters, which was owned by Gene Autry and then Turner, and now it's Time Warner, Columbia Warner, all right, that own chips now. I had accumulated 50% of the net profits participation. And the deal was that my smoking gun was that they had to deliver six years with me. And this was going to be the start of the fifth year. So I said, well, attorneys, let's go in and see the head of the studio and tell them that I own 50% net profits participation. And let's get a quarterly payment schedule contract done. So we walk in to see David Beagleman. And he says, uh, what are you doing here? Because it was on about 10.30. We came right from stage three. I just walked off the set, grabbed the lawyers, and we went up to the tower. All right? <laughs> I walk in, and he said, what are you doing here? You know, holding a production. They just called. They said, they're waiting for you. You should go back and do your thing. I said, I will. But here are my attorneys. I understand that you guys made a $75 million 10-year run, a first-run syndication of chips. Well, I own 50% of the net profits participation. Here's my attorneys. I want to draw up a contract. He says, you got to wait for the show to be in syndication. You can't just. And just before I did that, a couple of days before, I watched James Gardner on 60 Minutes talking about how it took him 11 years to get his net profits participation because from Rockford Files, where he produced it and starred in it. So he saw where the money was going. He saw that we blew up that car, painted it yellow, blew it up again, then painted it green, blew it up. He saw where it was going. And they were telling him they're not making any money. If you go way back to Fess Parker, who was in Daniel Boone, maybe before your time, yeah. uh, Fess Parker, you played Daniel Boone. He had 5% of the show. He never got it. Mm. All of them that had percentages of net profit. I, I'm at the gym. Vince's gym, the guru down here at the bottom of my street, Vince's gym. Uh, he's no longer there. He passed. But I used to go to him. He used to say, there's only one Puerto Rican to a gym. And Eric Estrada is it, folks. <laughs> 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 he was, I loved him. He was a great guy. He really was. A little cuckoo, but great. <laughs> so Robert Blake is bench pressing. And I go, hey, Robert. Because all the I used to go there at five thirty in the morning with all the guys, you know. After a weekend in Studio Fifty Four, I get back uh, Sunday night. I hit the gym that week to you know to get to get to sweat out all the bad poison that's in the air down there. You know? <laughs> oh, that's that's tough. Tough. Yeah, you have to, or else it don't stick to you, and you go ah. You know, <laughs> yeah. really. So um, he's working out, and I go. All the stunt guys from Clean Eastwood movies, Carl Weathers, Stallone would pop in. Schwarzenegger would pop in every, every so often. And we're all there. Where I used to get in between the stunt guys, pick them up, put them down, pick them up, put them down, you know, and get a good workout and then go go to Chips and drink aloe vera water for a week. <laughs> <laughs> so Blake is working out. And I go, hey, Blake, I just acquired another 10 points of net profits participation. I got 35 points now. And he says, you know, you're an ass. He called me an ass H. I don't want to say asshole. So we won't say asshole. Okay. Yeah. Bad word. Bad word. Bad. There are kids listening. 
so I say, um, I say, uh, what do you mean? Why do you say that? He says, I own 33 and a third percent of Beretta. I sell it to you for 10 cents. <laughs> I said, whoa, after seeing, hearing that, and then after seeing what's his face, Rock for Files, James Gardner, I said, I'm going to, I'm going to take the fight, not the fight, but the thing to, to them. So I'm in there. Beagleman says, you got to be back in the union. You, and we don't, you don't get to anything until syndication. I said, no, sir. No, sir, because you're selling off MGM. You sold the back lot. You're selling the library. We're going to be in syndication. I'm going to call here. Nobody's going to answer the phone. I said, so I want to make it a quarterly payment now because you guys made your deal. And he says, you know, Estrada, you think you're a big shot. You come to Hollywood. You bring your lawyers in here. You were nothing when you came to Hollywood. You were nothing but a spick box boy. Hmm. <laughs> My reaction was this. I got the biggest smile because I knew what he wanted me to do. He wanted me to hit him so he could own me. And that wasn't going to happen. My two lawyers, they were white. But this time they were out of space white. They didn't know what I was going to do. Yeah. So anyway, I stood up and looked at Mr. Beagleman. I said, Mr. Beagleman, you know, at the age of five, I used to sell snow cones in the streets of Harlem with my grandfather for about three, four summers until the block of ice melted away or we shaved it away. And then I worked at Columbus Circle. I used to shine shoes every Saturday and Sunday mornings. I'd be shining shoes for a couple of years. Then I worked at Jack's Wash and Dry on 44th Street, 9th Avenue after school. I always had a job. I always had a job. That's what we did then. You grew up in the ghetto. What do you do? You either become a punk or you, you know, bring some change home to your mom, you know, and you're living on welfare. Okay. So, but I never box groceries. And I walked out. They proceeded, since they controlled the media, uh, like today is controlled, I won't say anymore. Yeah. Uh, they immediately splashed all over Variety, Hollywood Reporter, that, that, that. Eric Estrada, breach of contract, refuses to show up. $40 million lawsuit against him by MGM. That's when I knew I had them. And when I knew I had them even more is when they brought in Bruce Jenner. All I had to do was sit like this and wait and wait it out because they weren't about to give back any of that $75 million because they can't deliver two seasons without a strata. They weren't doing that. So, they, you know, they scared the shit out of me deliberately. They would put shit that I was a bad boy. I was a Pain in the ass. I was this and all that, and this and all that, this and all that. And then the only thing that had me really uptight was I already moved my mother to 57th and 8th. <laughs> I wasn't going to move <laughs> back to the projects. I said, Ma, back it up. We're going back to the projects. Me or no? <laughs> yeah. So anyway, they came back after seven weeks and settled with me. They settled with me and they bought my 50%. I sold it to them for. A nice piece of change. But they already stained my name and stained me and, and everything. And they made sure that I could not work in this town. And for 10 years, what I did was I roamed the country and the world. I went to Italy, did a movie for a couple of weeks with Franco Nero, Max Mancidao, and uh, Tony Musante. And I play El Greco, the bishop of the mafia. He was El Greco was the name. Then I went to Peru and did a movie for three months, from the south of Peru to the Cusco, Machu Picchu. I had the oh. best time. Oh my God! Then I went to Thailand and did another movie for three months because all these producers from all these countries, Chips was so big and popular, and still is. It still is. Very, yeah. pop very popular all over the world. Uh, thank God for that. That's a blessing that I got, and I appreciate it. But 
So all these producers that want to do a little something in their country, they want to get somebody from America, throw them in there. Boom. So I, I, I went, Geraldine Chaplin, her husband was, I forget his name, but he did the Superman movies. And he gave her 10 million and said, here, go away somewhere, make something, you know, but get out of the house. So she made a movie. <laughs> I was cast in it. She played a role in it. Tony Curtis played a role in it. Ron Moody from, uh, you know, I'm reviewing the situation. Da, 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 da. You know, from uh, uh, Oliver Twist, the musical. Yeah. And Orson Welles, baby. Oh, wow. Yeah, Orson Welles. Yeah. Yeah, it was awesome. It was so awesome. And I lived at the same James Club in London for three months. Come on. <laughs> so I was out there. Then I came back to America and nothing. And then I get a movie in Mexico. So I go down there. By that time, I don't know how to read or speak Spanish properly. I spoke Spanglish. I spoke crap. Like the proper way to say shit in Spanish is mierda. <laughs> I used to say, mierda. See what I mean? Yeah. So I'm down there doing a movie. I'm talking in English. The other people are talking in Spanish. And they have interpreters and everything. So we get it done. And it's a three-week gig. And while I'm there, I get approached by the number one Aaron Spelling of telenovela soap operas, Emilio La Rosa. Took me a week to be able to say that. La Rosa. <laughs> so, so uh, and he says, I want him to do a soap opera where you, uh, you're the protagonist, you're the lead, you're married, and you have a hitchhike, and you fall in love with her, and now you're married with two women. <laughs> I go, thank you very much, but I got to tell you, I don't know how to read or speak Spanish. He says, ah, don't worry about it. We make it that you were born in Mexico, raised in San Diego, you came back and married. <laughs> your childhood friend. I said, oh, cool. I'm going to be speaking like eight words in English and maybe two in Spanish. And in my case, I hope it's si or no. Si or no. <laughs> two and a half months go by. I get a script sent. And I can't read it. I can't read the script. I can't read it. I can't read it. I can't read it. It's all Spanish. So I'm totally embarrassed. This guy in the Latin culture, you don't dis disgrace another person of stature of not because they're rich or whatever, but because they've achieved something in their life. So this guy is like the spelling of telenovelas. Each novella he ever made was number one hit, you know? And I tell my manager, Conrad, Conrad, look, you got to get me out of this. I'm really embarrassed. I can't read it, but we can't say no to this guy's because that would be total disrespect. And I can't do that. We can't do that. So I say, they want me down there for three months to shoot 100 episodes. Okay. And I can't even memorize this stuff, let alone read it. So they, they have a method down there. They put a little earpiece in here and a little microphone on the other side. And the things are down here. And they feed you the lines. You hear them and you repeat. It took me two weeks to learn it. It's a technique. I got it. I can do it. But I said, they want me down there for three months. I tell you what I want you to do. I want you to chase them away. Chase them away. Ask for $500,000, not pesos, you know. And he says, you sure you want me to do that? I says, yeah, we can't say no. We got to chase them away. So <laughs> I figure phew, that's the way to get out of it because I'm totally embarrassed. I can't read the thing anyway. So hey, no skin off my nose, right? They say yes. Yeah. They meet your offer. <laughs> Call your bluff. Yeah. So now I really freak out. I said, oh, my God. God, no, we got to get me out of this corner. You don't understand. This shit is hard. Get me out of it. I can't pronounce words. I can't even speak proper Spanish. I speak Spanglish because I spent my youth in the street working. 
shining shoes, always working, and conversing with Spanish. No, I had a deal in English. So I say, well, they want me to live there for three months. I don't want to live in a hotel. So you tell them that I want to look for a place, a house or an apartment building. And I, I, I want a driver with a car of the year to take me every morning back and forth three months to the studio. And I want a chef in the house. I want a bodyguard and I want a cell phone, which was buck a minute, a buck a minute back then, <laughs> a buck a minute. And I was always on that bitching to my wife, man, these motherfuckers. <laughs> They're always late. They're... They use Vicks to cry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and she, you know, she just sit back and yes, honey, but you do well. You get you get some to eat and and knock it out tomorrow. Okay, dear. I, I needed somebody, you know, to, to pitch and wine with. So they s say yes to that. Now I'm stuck. I'm stuck. I'm stuck. And I want to decorate it to my liking. <laughs> so they say, yes, now I'm really stuck. I'm over a barrel. I go to Blitz in Northridge Language Academy. And I grab a beautiful teacher. And we banged it out for like six. <laughs> six. Well, we banged it out. And I learned Spanish. <laughs> and I learned my Spanish suitable, but also I was going to have help down there because they feed you the line. In my case, it's better for me. And we got a guy to work with me. And then I made them give me two secretaries every night to go to my apartment. Oh, so wait, wait. So I look at a bunch of houses and I go, wow, this is pretty. That's pretty. Something from the 70s, the 50s, 60s in a beautiful, expensive neighborhoods. But then I say, you know what? Some Saturday morning, you're going to have somebody at my gate with their head through the gate going, hey, Pancho, photo, Pancho. I busted my chops. I said, that ain't going to happen. So I took a beautiful building. In, uh, in Las Palmas, which is a very high-end Jewish Mexican community. You know, it's like Century Plaza, uh, one of those buildings over there. So I took took that building, the 27th floor, was it? Yeah, the same as my mom. You open up, the elevator opens up, and it's your whole floor. Wow. It's that kind of thing. They had a heliport. They had a supermarket private. You have to sign in to come in the building and all that. People, visitors. And then I decorated it to my liking. I said, in the foyer here, I want a black onyx piano. Oh, do you play? No, I don't play, but I like the look. So put one here. <laughs> I made them build me a tiki hut in the living room. <laughs> Why not? And then the rest and the rest. And then I went down there, three months. I figured three months, hey, get my 5K, get out. No. At 90th episode, they added another 160 episodes. Oh, wow. You know, yeah. So I renegotiate. And, and, and then I said, I can't take it down here. I got to fly home every weekend. So every week Friday, I would fly in the 507 Delta flight into Los Angeles. Nana would pick me up when it was my weekend with my boys. She'd bring them. we go to Toys R Us. Then I come, I smoke a cigar in my backyard or one of my decks because I built like tears to, for places to go. And I have a cigar, take it off me. She'd make me a cappuccino and, and to take the weekend off the week off me. And then I go back Sunday night, red eye to go back. After the 160, they added another 100. We did, oh. we did 457 episodes of the longest running, highest rated telenovela soap opera in Latin history. Still, 30 years later, it's still number one. In Wow. I did not know this about you. I did not know that about your career. Of, there's a lot of things. I don't do publicity. I have never done a podcast. I don't like publicity. I don't like interviews. 
I don't do them. I did yours because Calvin twisted my nuts. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, because Calvin adores mm. you. You're a treasure to him. And I treasure Calvin. So he asked yeah, me. I asked, but I told him, don't ever ask me again. Because I don't do <laughs> he, told, he actually told me that. He, he did say that you said that. So I am yeah, super yeah. appreciative. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, and uh, I understand your what you've gone through and going through. And I've gone through a few things. I don't want to say publicly. Because and then people go, ooh, ooh, ooh. You know, Eric Estrada. Yeah. Hey, hey. Nah. That's why I don't do interviews. I just don't do them. Nobody knows. Half the country doesn't know that I'm a real cop. A real sworn in cop. Yeah, I took a laser okay. shot at the police academy. Okay? okay, they wanted to mace me. They wanted to mace me or tase me. I said, no, 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 you're not going to ruin my hair <laughs> with that shit. <laughs> I'll take the shot. Shoot me. But oh, uh, no kidding. Yeah, there's a well, lot of things. Child predators I, I, don't do, I don't do publicity. I don't care for it. Yesterday, and I don't, I don't hang out. I don't. I don't do that. I didn't get into this business for that part of it. I got into it to make money so I can get my go. mother out of the jungle and put her in paradise. And I was able to do that. Can you imagine? And I know this is a dream that every child, boy and girl has for their parents. They yeah. want to do something for their parents. I was able to live that dream and make it happen. So... God bless you. Yeah. Good yeah, he you. did. He yeah. did. And he continues to bless me. He continues to bless me. I mean, I'm doing two series right now as we speak. I don't do PR on it. I won't do PR on it. One is called The Servant. We just shot the first episode in San Antonio. And another one, it's streaming now. Two seasons of something called Divine Renovation. That one I do because it's good for my soul. I love it. Okay. You know, and then there's talk another thing. And, the, and yesterday I was, I was invited to the Chinese theater for the Hondo premiere because I'm in the third episode with uh, Goggins in his new show, oh. big Amazon thing that I did a year ago for them. And they told me I had to sign a piece of paper, say I wouldn't talk about it. Well, I wouldn't talk about it anyway. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, <laughs> I could have gone to the premiere and had all that red carpet bullshit. <clears throat> I'm done. As a matter of fact, the Hollywood Christmas Parade, I did it for 14 years straight. I just quit. Yeah. No more. No more. Well, it's very two different aspects of the industry. I will give you that because it's a two different beasts. So they are entirely different. The acting from the PR and it is. It's a different, a different game. I don't love it either. So well, we anyway. thank you so much for sharing with us. I mean, like, I, I feel hey, we're blessed. Absolutely. <laughs> one, one more thing. Yeah. Uh, so my soap opera was knocking the crap out of anything that was on 7 o'clock on ABC, CBS, and NBC. Just knocking it out. You couldn't get your uh, your your day worker to wash the kids or the dishes and a lot of the guys used to complain to me, say, man, I had to buy another VHS <laughs> because Juanita won't do the dishes. You know, during that time, the kids, it was religion. This thing was religion. And then, of course, yeah. Rupert Murdoch bought it and he aired it all over the world in all his star channels around the, the, the globe, in Europe and all that. So it was knocking so much out that the American people just said, you know what? We got to get Estrada. We got to get Estrada to do a, a guest spot. So the nanny called. I did a nanny. I did a movie with Bill Cosby, TV movie. I did Martin, three of them. I did uh, oh. this show and that show and this show and that show and that show. But by that time, I didn't care anymore. You know? I really didn't care anymore. Because uh, when you become an actor, you become an actor for a reason. Okay, I was attracted to, I want the bread, but my <laughs> initial initial thing that happened to me was what? And then the bread idea came in. I said, well, how do I make money with this thing? I need to. Was when I would perform 
and I did the high school play, got the drama award and all that. But when I would perform and people would come backstage and say, hey, man, I love what you did in that scene. Oh, that scene was, oh, that was so good. And, and that other thing was so great. They would do that. And I would say, wow, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. You believed me. Okay with what they felt, but none of them felt what I felt while I was doing it. And that's what I wanted more of. Something that nobody could take away from me. You know? Yeah. Because when you grow up the way I grew up, it's like this. Or your shit that would get taken. So that's what got me hooked. That was the hook. And then how do I make money? How do I, you know? So I went after it. Well, you but, did it. <laughs> but, you know. You fucking did it. <laughs> and I've got two shows going out there already, but I don't care. You could stream my show. It's called Divine Renovation. It, the first season is six episodes. We shot it in Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, 60 minutes. The second season is 30 minutes. And now we're working on the third, fourth, and fifth, you know, as we go. If it happens, it happens. At this point, I'm at that age. It's like golf. I used to. <laughs> now I play whack fuck. Whack. <laughs> Happy Gilmore golf. <laughs> whack them all. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so life, why not? Listen, life is good. Life is good. Uh, I cherish every day now because I just had some things go down. I'm not going to mention because then the public will go, oh my God. <laughs> You know, but life is good. Just in other words, I'm telling you that life is good. And you're such a beautiful looking woman. I mean, you're hot. So, you know, <laughs> thank you. You, you know, you're very attractive. So just live your life. Enjoy each day. Take it as it come. Each day is a gift now. It At is. 75, I can say that, you know? Yeah. No, yeah. I learned that. I learned that quickly here. So um, that's that's what I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. I should have shaved for you next time. Okay. You did good. You did good. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Hey, uh, wow. I, I'm, I'm sorry I rattled on like that. No, but if, not at all. It. People don't know this about me. You know, and there are other things that I could pull up, but that's okay. We're good. Yeah. yeah I, I hope you got what you wanted and that made you happy, makes you happy, and fulfills yeah. whatever one it want you want because now i'm gonna jump calvin and say get me a gig and shut up <laughs> get to work yes get out there yes well hopefully i'll see you on one of those soon yeah baby yeah, yeah, i got sure. it yes yeah. yes hey dude eric you, i really I, tell me tell funny. me about you dave <laughs> there's, there's not a lot to know the audience already knows about me but i'm a i'm a long time uh, radio sportscaster and, oh, okay. uh, and 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 doing this show with nicole has been a blast so it's become a fantastic friend but I, I gotta tell you two things i gotta mention before you go eric real quick one is i have a very close friend of mine his name is jim bettencourt chp is going to retire in a few years right. and i know you were the inspiration for him becoming a chp officer and has done a fantastic job for years and takes a lot of pride in it and i know uh, he'll be excited to know that we had a chance to speak to you today and cool. also at, at the same time i was thinking as being part of my childhood because i don't know if you realize how many kids around the world drove down the street exactly right next to each other on their bikes because yeah. of chips <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, uh, yeah, you know, when I was doing the show, I was too busy living in the motorhome, you know what I mean? And having, <laughs> yes. a, great, and having a great time. <laughs> I, I didn't think of that. But me and Larry get together and we go around the country doing this and that. This weekend, I'm going to be in Spokane. I'm doing a, a car show. I do a lot of car shows. They're great because they hit you with a fee and that's it, you know? And then whatever you porn is yours. Uh, but it's great. And the people you meet, uh, you know, uh, family people, the home people, the house people, the, the working class. The, it's wonderful. I love it. I love being surrounded by that. Uh, but me and Larry have talked about it. 
we look at each other, we go, Jesus Christ, you and I were so busy fighting each other and yelling about this, yelling about that. My <laughs> home is longer and bigger than yours. My jacuzzi works better than yours, whatever. <laughs> I used to tease the shit out of him. I used to say, after a shot, we're out in the sun. I said, okay, hey, tell Mo, my driver, who used to drive my uh, motorhome, tell him to turn the jacuzzi on, 85 degrees, okay? I'm coming, I'll be there in 10 minutes after this scene. And Larry would stand and go, <laughs> and he screamed, favorite nations, favorite nations. <laughs> I never had a jacuzzi. I was just shit. Was, yeah. Anyway, fantastic. But anyway, but we realized, uh, we realized we get, oh, thanks, mom. Yeah, baby. Thank you. I just got fresh squeezed pineapple juice. Nice. Because, so my skin will glow. That's right. <laughs> anyway, anyway, we realize I get a lot of officers, first responders. I get a lot of people that come up and say, hey, I couldn't make it as, as a police officer, but I became this and that because of your show, because of you guys. I'm a cop today because of you guys. You guys inspire me. But the, the wonderful thing about chips, not only, you know, the, I, I redesigned the uniform totally. I took all the air out of it. And I took it out of a can every morning and just went, Shh. I sprayed it on. It was so tight. <laughs> <laughs> I, did. Yep. I, I did. I had the pockets cut out. Uh, we appreciated it. Yeah, I, I, you know, I did a lot. <laughs> and you make your muscles look bigger by tightening the, the shirt. That's you right. Then your muscles yeah. look bigger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. But yeah, the wonderful thing, and I'll end with this, about the show was that when people see us, they go, ah, 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 ah. I had your poster on my locker, on my ceiling, on my knee, but hey, my mother, my kid. and then they stop and they get emotional. They get a warm, fuzzy feeling because that was an eight o'clock family hour show that they sat with their mom, their grandma, their uncle, their niece, their first boyfriend, first girlfriend, their brothers and sisters, and watched the show. So they remember when they see us, and then they remember them who have passed on, maybe. Yeah. And they really get emotional. So that was the blessing of the show. That was the good thing of the show. I would say that was the major hook. Yeah, you know, when families yeah. all sat around one TV and spent sure. time together. Yeah, yeah. Park, Those back days. then you could, we never drew our guns. Back then you could park the kid in front of the TV and go to the toilet. Don't worry about what he's watching or hearing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Good days, good days. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Okay, I'll go. Thank you, you Papa. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I hope you got enough to edit. <laughs> no, we're good. We got we're, it. we're good. Yeah. Thank you yeah, so much, thanks Eric. Thanks for sharing with us. Yeah. Maybe we do it again. Seven yeah. Months. Perfect. Okay. Good Absolutely. deal. Absolutely. Deal. That was great. Okay. You guys are easy to talk to. And I'm sorry I didn't know about you because who had time to get into sports when I was a kid? Ah, I yeah. Don't worry about me. I had this is win. all Nicole. Don't worry about me at all. We're all good. We're all good. <laughs> Eric, thank you so much. Wish you all the best. Thank you. God bless you both. Hi. Bye. See you later. Bye. Wow, that was that was that was cool. I tell you what, I, and now and the long interviews I enjoy. You know, as I, I'm always, you know, you and I have spoken for a long time about how everybody has a story and how they got there. I love the fact, Nicole, that his inspiration was his mom. You know, no matter what, yeah. that was his goal that kept him going. And obviously, he was extremely hard worker. But that his mom is the one that you know inspired him to work so hard and make her life better. And I bet, you know, his last day on earth, he would say, what, what was your number one accomplishment? He'd say, I took care of my mom. You know, it's important well, you and, know, and he realized like, his dream. Sometimes when certain people have longevity and certain, you know, people don't and everything, and then you see that side of them and you see why he had, because he's a good soul, a like good person. That, exactly. You know, this is why good things happen. And, you know, he's lived this wonderful life. I mean, listen, he was my neighbor and he's not kidding about the Rolls Royce. I would see him in like a, maybe it was white or white convertible one cruising around studio yeah. city all the time. And it was always like, here it goes. And it was, you know, <laughs> we passed each other on the street and it was just like, you know, um, just such an icon, just so cool. Such a cool dude. Such, you know, family man, obviously still and married and, 
living in that same beautiful house that he has. It's in a beautiful location. And um, yeah, it's so fun to hear all the backstory and, and the fight and the, because so many people exactly think right. this is all handed to you, right? And, yes. and then you hear like, what a hustle, you know, really working exactly for right. it and really going for it. And it's, it's just, it's wonderful. It's so cool. No, that I enjoy. I enjoy that a lot. I tell yeah. you what, we'll uh, we'll do. We're going to get to the questions, of course, that people don't have to write in. Again, if you want to get to Nicole's mailbag, we will. We'll we'll get those to you. This was a longer show, so I want to give time to you know put time into your answers as far as the questions go. But we're getting people that, that are really interested in reaching out to you, and, and I love the fact that they want to pick your brain. But again, perfectlytwistedpod.com. dot com. Look at uh, Nicole's daily mailbag, and and we'll get to those. But uh, Nicole, this was this was uh, a lot of fun today. I, I'm, yeah. I'm glad you uh, you you felt well enough to to be here, and, and I agree, you look great. So um, I'm glad he pointed that out as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you, and thanks, guys. Give us a like uh, if you enjoyed the show, and we um, just thank you, thank you for tuning in, and thank you for letting us do what we love and getting to have these fun stories with these fun guests, and um, just supporting us and doing what we love. So thanks, guys, and. We'll see you next week.